You know what? Ranking stuff sucks. It's boring, it's reductive in a way that never seems to lend itself to actually discussing why something is better or worse than something else in a productive manner, and I can only make so many jokes about how or why something sucks before I feel like everyone would rather just see me drag a PNG of the item onto a chart in Photoshop and say, there, that's, that, that's where it is, deal with it. I don't really know what this video is, so just think of this video as like a wish list style Google Doc where I just dump all my non-productive ideas because the Adderall hit an extra hard today or something, I don't know. I'm also not going to wish for anything. I already have a solid enough reason to believe will be in the DLC anyways. So no Abundance Twin Blade, no spitballing ideas for new sleep or rot incantations, and as much as I would flip shit if bigger pots actually were just their own type of consumable, there's already a five second clip of what could only be the player character heaving a goddamn orbital strike right into some dude's face, meaning it won't be mentioned in this video. Also, no lore speculation. Yeah, to just just no no spec no lore speculation, just none of it. That's not why any of you come to me anyways, but just thought I'd throw that in there too. There's an entire industry out there that thrives off of collecting and misusing your personal data, taking advantage of your vulnerability, and in some extreme cases, literally holding your data hostage via ransomware and malvertising. NordVPN has an extremely simple solution to all of these problems, from simple features like threat protection all the way to proper computer science genius, like a dark web monitor that scans malicious websites for personal data, IP leaks, and more. NordVPN is really starting to become more than just another VPN service. If you purchased two-year plan using my link in the description and pinned comment, you'll even receive four free months as a bonus on top of that. If you're out in public somewhere, at an airport, or if you're traveling abroad and want to use the internet with as little risk as possible, or even if you're just on your, your lunch break or something, I don't know, a safe and secure VPN is really the only correct answer. When you download it, it's literally as simple as just navigating to it on your PC and pressing connect. You can even tell it to launch on PC startup so it connects automatically. Every purchase of the two-year plan comes with four additional months for for free using the link nordvpn.com slash rustyvpn in the description and pinned comment. And if there's ever any second thoughts, you have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so nothing to worry about financially. Keeping your own house clean before buying a second one is solid advice no matter where you're at in life. And I like to think the same is true for video game maintenance. Someone in the community by the name of Sekiro Doobie recently data mined an entirely new cutscene involving Melina and Torrent, approaching the player at the beginning of the game after they get no-scoped by the grafted Scion. And the video itself actually raises some good points about how weird and just uncanny the intro sequence actually plays out. Upon dying in the intro, in comes the iconic fade to black, followed by this weird audio clip of what I can only assume to be the same Scion dumping your ass by a riverbank somewhere, hoping the rats kill you instead. But what's awkward about this sequence is that this plays no matter how you bite it in the intro. Whether or not the Scion actually knocks you out, the exact same fate to black happens regardless. Melina and Torrent are both seen in the cave in which you wake up, despite the door being closed, although I guess they could have just materialized out of thin air like they usually do. And the file name of the intro cutscene sorta of suggests that you were actually supposed to wake up on a beach somewhere by the seaside river ruins. And this just really got me thinking about all the little details that constantly end up getting cut just due to there being barely not enough time to implement them. Like, 1.02 was just a, a fucking mess. I, I don't think I need to remind anyone just what a sorry state everything was in. NPC quest lines involving very important characters weren't completely finished. Summoning Torrent had a small chance of suspending you in midair before inconveniently unaliving you. Arcane scaling just flat out just didn't work. And although most of these problems were fixed within a couple weeks, some of them also weren't. And and were just treated as afterthoughts. Kale still has a completely unimplemented quest line that literally had to be both data mined and restored by the same creator I mentioned earlier for people to even play it. Ruin fragments deal one point of damage no matter what, despite it seemingly have an A scaling in strength, and Mog used to be able to count down from sex. You know, you know what? Actually, I think I might know why that one didn't make it in. Never mind. I salivated like any normal person would have over Mesmer's feet, but I think there's something to be said about having a strong foundation. I don't see a reason why they could have just put in a slightly different cutscene reflecting the nature of how you get incapacitated during the intro. Like, there's no need to go overboard with it or anything. It could just be as simple as changing the very next sound we hear in the game. There's also the completely nixed lore drop involving Redeemers, a specific faction of Tarnish that worshipped the god 
God of Vengeance, and there's also whatever the fuck the seat of the sun would have ended up being. There's an entire charcuterie of cut content they could waste no time in bringing back, but for whatever reason have chosen not to. And I don't know these reasons, nobody knows these reasons, it could have been as simple as, oh shit, sorry, I forgot, or there could have been a data crash that nuked all the files beyond recovery. Or the creative direction could have just taken a handbrake turn into fuck itville to make room for all the jars. I, I, I don't know, nobody knows. But there's also simpler quality of life changes that shouldn't be ignored, such as the Ruin Fragment being permanently locked at one damage, or standard damage getting multiplied in New Game Plus cycles even though it's technically a subtype of physical damage that already gets multiplied anyways, resulting in this extremely uncomfortably steep difficulty spike around New Game Plus 5 and onward that to this day I'm not even sure is intentional, but maybe it is, I don't know. Usually this is what pre-DLC maintenance patches are for, and FromSoft is no stranger to these. So there is a very strong chance most of what I'm bitching about might not even be problems come this summer, or they might do something totally different. I just like the idea of cleaning up the base game a little as a means of preparing for the DLC. Most people probably wouldn't even notice or care if these changes actually took place, but when effort is willing to be committed to such small details that don't really make or break the game, I feel like that's what people do notice. And I think Elden Ring can afford to make some small improvements here and there, regardless of whether or not the game actually needs them. This one's been a hot topic for a while, and worse yet, it's been a staggeringly difficult conversation to navigate due to there not being a clear and obvious answer. I have no problem admitting the presence of PvP exclusive status effects have always felt awkward for just everyone involved, when there are entire features of the game you could easily miss out on just because you forgot you had sheet engine running, it, it, it gets pretty hard to defend. But I also know enough about what I don't know about game development to confidently say that it's never really as simple as just change death blow forehead. I don't think it's a coincidence that whenever people talk about reworking an entire status in the game, it's suddenly very easy to sound stupid and ridiculous. Just make enemies die when they get hit with it, duh, it's death blight, it's in the name. What do you mean bosses would be too easy? Just write a sentence about how shard bearers are immune to its effects and slap it on a flower no one gives a double-fisted fuck about. Elden Ring's Dark Moon mod has a pretty good example of what a PvE-ify death blight would theoretically look like. Death blight is still a status effect that can be built up like any normal status and its DOT effect when successfully procced doesn't appear to be too different from poison or rot on the surface, but if an enemy is, or if you are, within close proximity of another enemy who's been afflicted, death blight will begin to accumulate on them as well. Inflicting blight on an enemy who is already currently afflicted will immediately put them down, so long as their health is within a critical percentage. The buildup on items like death flare and spells like Fia's Mist and Death Lightning have also been upped, but any source of death blight caused by the player can now affect the player as well. I think Elden Ring Reforged provides another example where anything that's breathing can basically be considered weak to death blight, the only major exceptions being dragons and like spirit enemies and stuff. And in this mod, death blight is rebuilt to more of a support type status that decreases enemies' attack power in addition to yielding 10% more runes when defeated. NPCs and such still only require a single proc to be instantly killed, but susceptible enemies need to be afflicted twice in a row, once to weaken them and once again while the effect is still active. As cool as I think it would be to invent a completely new way for Deathblight to work in single player that's completely apart from what it usually does, I really feel like that's just making the problem more difficult than it needs to be. Take Frenzy Flame Incantations, for instance. Part of the reason they're so favored across the board is because they have both online and offline applications. Madness is a specific status ailment that only affects other Tarnished, meaning the only way your average PvE Andy will ever feel the chaotic joy of making someone literally lose their goddamn mind is through NPC invasions. However, Frenzy flame is still flame, and being set on fire isn't a pain exclusive to other players. Unendurable Frenzy is still one of the most popular incantations because of its high, yet surprisingly sustainable damage with certain builds, and the skin's simmeringly high velocity of Frenzy Burst doesn't give a shit if whatever you're pointing at has a dodge option because I know and they know it won't be enough. Frenzy Flame spells are still good, but not because they're specifically tied to a status. They have other utilities and properties that add to their versatility, while dealing status feels feels more like a cherry on top of the sundae and not the sundae itself. I think we were kind of heading in that direction with Death Lightning, but this and Fia's Mist are the only two Death Blight spells currently available, and the fact that they're parts of two completely different magic subtypes just makes the concept of Death Blight feel kind of divided, in my opinion. If you wanted to gather all the Death Blight related spells and unify them under a particular subtype, I think the easiest no-brainer thing to do would probably be to have that centered around Godwin. His association with the Ancient Dragons could potentially 
open up a really nice introduction to a subtype of Death Blight incantations that treat lightning damage the same way Frenzy Flame incantations treat fire damage. They still have a very obvious leaning towards that status, but afflicting something with Death Blight would never feel like the main goal when casting them. After all was said and done, they would still be lightning incantations at their core. Sleep isn't technically a PvP exclusive status, but I feel like it could be given the same treatment, just with magic damage instead of lightning or fire. As it stands currently, there aren't any sleep incantations or magic subtypes that revolve around sleep specifically, and I'm sure that's going to change here in the next few months, so I do want to just abstain from going down any creative rabbit holes when there's already a plenty solid enough floor plan to look forward to, at least I hope there is, but I do think this whole idea of inventing an entire second way for certain statuses to contribute more to PvE is kind of just unnecessary. I don't think it needs to be such a complicated answer that we're basically making an entirely new status ailment. I really do think it's just as simple as pointing at the Frenzy Flame incantations and just being like, there, now do that with lightning or something. If we take a close look at souls throughout the years, catalysts have historically been much more complicated than just pointing a staff and shooting a crystal. Weapon catalysts like the Immolation Tender allowed the casting of sorceries while also doubling as a fire halberd, and the Sanctum Shield from Dark Souls 2 allowed the casting of both sorceries and miracles, and despite not saying so in its description, could even cast hexes as well. Beginner sorceries and general spells tend to abide by the same rules for the sake of simplicity. Sorceries fire a straightforward projectile of damage, while incantations or miracles are usually consigned to support abilities like healing or status alleviation. However, in previous Souls games, certain schools of magic were very closely tied to a specific stat. It was extremely rare for a miracle to ask any intelligence of the player, and equally rare to see a faith requirement on a sorcery, making a dual catalyst like the Crystal Chime that much more valuable. Elden Ring handles the distribution of stats a bit differently, and sorceries and incantations are much more versatile than they were in any previous iterations. Incantations can now take advantage of reliable sources of magic damage like Glintstone Breath, and sorceries are starting to explore various status applications, which, with the exception of Frostbite, was commonly only seen on miracles in the past. You also have magma sorceries, aberrant sorceries, and fundamentalist incantations that usually require double stat investments, despite only being a sorcery or an incantation. So, I don't think anyone can really say if the idea of dual catalysts might be compatible with the world of Elden Ring especially since its magic system is only divided into two overarching magic types. I wouldn't rule out the possibility of FromSoft introducing a third type of magic that focuses more on mechanics like sleep or death blight or something else, but as it stands now, having a single catalyst that can cast literally every spell in the entire game, that, that, that just sounds a little nuts. Like I feel like that obviously wouldn't work for like balance reasons. And I think that kind of sucks, because the lore of the game, I personally think, is very friendly to that sort of idea. The Crystal Chime in Dark Souls 3 was once held by a holy maiden named Gertrude, but was then defiled by scholars of the Grand Archives, giving it appropriate reason to be able to cast both sorceries and miracles. And I don't know, it just sounds like you could pretty easily theme a catalyst around something like Rikard's Blasphemy in the same manner, and have a sort of defiled sacred seal that used to belong to some bitch in Landell, but Rikard coughed on it and now it can cast magma sorceries. The marriage of Radagon and Renala is also begging to be represented by a dual catalyst, or at least some type of unique catalyst with uncommon properties. The recurring use of double identities such as Margit and Morgod, or Mikola and Saint Trina, further reinforces these themes of duality that are seen through the game, and I think that just provides a very comfortable foundation from that perspective to introduce dual catalysts in a way that makes perfect sense. But the way the game is currently balanced, I just don't see that happening, unless they do actually plan to establish establish a third magic type in the game. So, so maybe you should you should do that if, if you haven't already done it. Weapon catalysts, on the other hand, just have no goddamn excuse. Like, Loretta's Warsicle should have been part catalyst. The Eclipse Shotel could have easily casted incantations with Death Blight as a passive instead of only when it's buffed. I think you could probably argue a case with the Devourer Scepter and maybe the Envoy Horns. I don't know, man. We had a fucking shield in Dark Souls 2 that could do this no problem. Like, it, it's not asking for a lot. Granted, it was also a, a DLC item, but it was a cool idea they've only ever attempted once, and I feel like no one talks about it. I do understand this sort of defeats the whole point of being able to place certain ashes on shields and weapons and whatnot, but the idea of catalysts like this existing in earlier Souls games kind of gave its universe a bit more color. Weapons with these capabilities were usually unique and unalterable anyway, so if, hypothetically, there was a weapon catalyst in Elden Ring, I don't think it would devalue the ash system in a way that prevented people from using it. 
I don't mean to resurface an old argument, but uh, that's exactly what I mean to do. And if said argument actually is done and over with, then none of this should bother you anyways. Fighting 16 copies of the same boss with a different name is inherently boring and unexciting. We could have done with a few less tree avatars and crucible knights, even if there was a sensible lore reason for them being where they were. But the core of a repeat boss has to do with how little they differ from their kin. Giving a knight's cavalry a flail instead of a halberd does give the world you're exploring a little more color and immersion, because sure, I guess it wouldn't make too much sense for every single cavalry unit to be carrying the exact same weapon and preparing for the exact same conditions, but it would be disingenuous to say these two are fundamentally different in any way. A good example of a repeat boss would be the Draconic Tree Sentinel. Modified physical design that uses the regular Tree Sentinel as a base, only appears twice in the whole game, has a surprise second phase that sets him mechanically apart from the rest of his friends, and drops uniquely themed Draconic items, all while having a perfectly solid and bad badass lore reason for their existence. Other great examples include the Falling Star Beasts, Deathrite Birds, and the game's extremely scarce rematch boss fights like Morgoth and Loretta. Okay, but like, I promise, my point isn't to open up an age-old discussion that people got sick of 10 months ago. I'm just using this as a diving board into my next point. Bosses aren't the only encounters where this happens. Have you ever paid attention to how certain rotten strays will attack you? Most strays behave the exact same. They bark a couple times and then they rush you in a not completely straight line, hoping they'll back you up against a wall or something in the process. Caleb strays, same thing. Just add a little bit of rot. But then you find the ones hanging out by the second church of Marika in Altus, and these... these these dogs, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're built different. They proc bleed, which isn't something normal strays do, and their attack animations are much more feral, as though they've completely lost control of themselves. You can see the same thing happening with the giant crows in Mog's palace. They don't appear like regular crows, they have these massive blood blisters on them that weigh them down and prevent them from flying, giving them this particularly disturbing element of surprise that banks entirely on you thinking you've encountered this enemy before and that they won't be a huge problem. I I want more of this. Like, I want a whole lot more of this. There wasn't a single person that got to this part of the game, saw this crow menacingly walking towards them across the blood lake, and consciously thought, you know what? I don't think that's a normal crow. Nope, no, I'm, I'm back and I'm back and out. Something about this is fucked. These crows are purposefully placed in wide open areas to fool the player into thinking flight is still something they can do, because the game doesn't even want you to think these are new enemies until they're literally front and center biting your nuts off, and that's just fucking awesome. How did it take us two full years for someone to point this out? And why did it have to come from a fucking tier list YouTuber? <laughs> I know there was an interview where Miyazaki said the exclusion of Covenants was intentional and everything, but I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, like, come the fuck on. This world you've built is begging for something to be introduced. Covenants, in case people aren't familiar, were essentially in-game factions you could align your character with that would change how you appeared in PvP, how you interacted with other players, and rewarded you with certain Covenant-specific items that, when redeemed at their respective altars, would give you really unique perks and equipment and stuff. Defeating another player as a watchdog of Farron gave you Wolf's Blood Sword Grass, which you could then hand over to the Old Wolf in exchange for for a curved greatsword, great shield, and a ring that boosted poise. Depending on which covenant you pledged allegiance to, you would get access to powerful spells like Sunlight Spear and Dark Moon Blade, and even weapons like the Bloodlust Katana. This was also how Dark Souls 3 handled its respecs. Now, according to Miyazaki in a pre-release interview, the system of covenants was done away with to make the game's PvP more accessible. The finger system was sort of meant to replace this. Allegiance with certain factions like the Volcano Manor or the Frenzied Flame still exist, but they seem to be more impactful on the single-player experience, such as the alternate Frenzied Flame ending. Additionally, you still can invade another world with a recusant finger, for instance, and have your in-game appearance reflect that of the Volcano Manor. I do agree with the principle of wanting to make your games as easy to experience as you possibly can, and knowing the game that Elden Ring is, it, it was vastly more important to focus on the single-player experience as a first priority. But making something accessible and making something rewarding don't have to be mutually exclusive. Player attitudes change over time, and once the single player experience was, well, e experienced, I think a lot of people would have been open to being more active in PvP if there was a little more, like, I don't know, ceremony behind it. The Colosseum update definitely helped, and the rebalancing of PvP was certainly needed, but there could also be rewards like unique weapons, talismans, and spells tied to a certain number of victories in the Colosseum or something. It would save players the trouble of having to dupe a remembrance because some of those items you could just make obtainable through PvP interactions instead. And now you have a bunch of field bosses walking around. You can use- actually, no, there's- wait. 
No, there, there's seven of these. That That's a lot. That would get annoying pretty quickly. Okay, maybe this idea isn't a good example, but you, you, you get the point. Bows just need to be better. They just do. They need to be better in so many different ways that I could unironically advocate for the addition of dildo arrows and still probably get a few claps from you. We have one, exactly one bow in the whole game that's cool enough to have its own unique skill. So unique, in fact, they didn't even bother to recolor it. Ammunition has this really weird separation going on where the great bows can only use magic and holy powered great arrows, whereas the Belliste are limited to fire and lightning great bolts. And I keep searching everywhere in the game where there might be a lore explanation for this plainly obvious elemental discrimination. Maybe one of the writers snuck it onto one of the tonics or D's dagger or Godfrey's holy golden toilet seat, and there's just nothing here. And if you don't have your own bow rework up on the Nexus, you just aren't considered part of the club. I'm not sure if I'm holding out hope for a mission we failed months ago because just enough players out there were also advocating for the hidden strength of bows that everyone just stopped caring, or if I just really want bows to be a more consistent weapon than they currently are. But bows seem to be permanently tied to sidearm position no matter how you build around them. They can't be infused, buffed, or greased. They have two talismans to choose from, and over half the long bows are just unique enough to prevent them from receiving different Ashes of War, most of which fucking suck anyways. And just like most facets of the game's combat, the promise of a DLC potentially just points to more of those options. I understand if bows take the backseat to the more prominent aspects of combat like spells, swords, boss fights. I honestly, I would be surprised and perhaps even worried if that weren't the case, but bows have always needed just a, a little more time in the oven, I feel like, and I, I don't I just really hope they get it. Out of the eight new weapon types being brought to the game in the DLC, we already know of five of them. This being double-bladed shields, reverse grip swords, martial arts abilities, odachi swords for Sephiroth builds, I guess, and a type of throwing dagger weapon that seems to function differently from the actual throwing knives currently in the base game. Since odachis can be thought of as the great sword counterpart of the regular old katana, I'm assuming at least one other weapon type will be greatified in terms of their size. Maybe a great halberd or a great scythe, whatever the shit that would look like. Dual great swords may also be a potential new weapon type, since we know FromSoft has messed around with that idea in the past. I think there's a lot of room for creative speculation here with these, because another thing Miyazaki said in this interview actually caught my attention, saying that a lot of ideas they had for the game clearly ended up not fitting into the rest of the project, and that said ideas would be tabled for DLC release instead. And I'm especially interested in whether or not this statement would possibly mean something for the DLC's weapon designs. It, it probably means nothing. In fact, I'm almost certain it does, but I'm going to take everyone idea splunking anyways. Looking at some of the more obscure weapon types FromSoft has handled in previous games, there's obviously the Cause Parasite, which turned you into a squid demon thing that could only pose an actual threat when paired with a special item called the Luminwood Rune. Trick weapons in general could honestly be a potential contender for a new weapon type. It would give plenty of room for them to mess around with what those weapons would look like, since their only type-defining characteristic would be transformation. It could be as simple as a unique set of paired swords, that transformed into a twin blade like the Rikuyo, or something as head-buttingly stupid as, as a, a living room door-shaped great shield that morphed into a, a fucking sentry turret or something. I also considered the possibilities of great flails and muskets, but one sounds boring as shit and the other one just doesn't make sense, so I'm just gonna mark those out. I've organized a short list of weapon types I think would make great additions to the fun of Elden Ring's combat that aren't too over-the-top or make-believe, while also being a far enough proximity away from the base game material. Magic Wands, a specific type of catalyst-based weapon that can only cast one particular sorcery, but with a full attack chain like you would see on other melee weapons. Scissor Blades, a type of split sword that pivots on a point when two-handed, resembling a giant pair of scissors a la Sundowner from Metal Gear Rising. War Fans, bladed fans that borrow from the Japanese-based martial art of Tessenjutsu, with a moveset that reminds you vaguely of the Kiyoshi Warriors. Grafting Weapons, weapons you attach to your arms in the same manner you would a fist or a claw, but they come in pairs. Sometimes even trios or quartets if the visual design is fetishistic enough. Blackjacks, a group of short clubs that act as a counterpart to the dagger weapon type that deal strike damage instead of slash and pierce. Also, please enjoy this secondary list of ideas that were either too boring or too obscure and stylistic for the scope of the game. Great scythes, throwable goats, dart guns, belt-fed crossbows, belt-fed regular bows, gun blades, magic textbooks, shoulder-mounted balliste. Okay, that's all I've got. If the DLC comes out and these aren't in the game, then any modders watching this have my permission to use these. I, I, I don't give a shit. During the last video, I said some nonsense about wanting madness dragons or something. Uh, you guys can just forget that happened. As always, you don't deserve an outro. Until next time.